Good morning. I'm glad you're able to take some time to devote to worship today. Uh, this is Halloween weekend, All Saints weekend, which is the moment in the life of the church that we uh, celebrate and are thankful for all the saints who have gone before us. And so that's part of the focus of, of this sermon and uh, the prayers that, that we offer this day. I hope you're able to take some time this weekend to remember the saints that have taught us a uh, faith, our faith, uh, who, who Jesus is and what it looks like to follow him. Today I'm going to be quoting extensively from the Bible, uh, no surprise, uh, but also I'm going to be quoting from a particular paraphrase, translation of the Bible called The Message. It's one I recommend to you. It, it reads, uh, it, it was, this was a translation done by a pastor who wants people to understand clearly what the, the Bible is getting at, and I found it very useful personally, especially as I'm reading the letters of Paul, which is what we're looking at today. So getting to this, right? I'd like you to take a moment and think about the worst situation that you've been in. What did it feel like? Was there anger or depression or detachment, frustration? Like what, what did that feel like? I know that for me, uh, I'm think, when I think of the, one of the harder moments in my life, uh, when I was turned down for ordination. Ordination in the Methodist Church functions, in a sense, like tenure at a school. And so if you get tenure, you know that you have a stable job and you, you can make plans for your future. And, and I, I was turned down for ordination uh, uh, two times, and the second time, it was a moment of, of this cold fear where I wasn't sure what my future was going to be now. It, down to just like the brass tacks of like, where was I going to live? That's part of a Methodist pastor's uh, job and pay is to live in the parsonage. And so if, if I was now getting a message that I was no longer going to be a Methodist pastor, I didn't have a place to live anymore. And like I was, I was very making some very hard decisions about what was my exit plan? Where would I go? Would I apply for, to work at Red Lobster or Olive Garden if I needed to get a job right now and move to Columbia? It became, a, and during this time, I'm still preaching every Sunday, and it became very hard to get up and proclaim anything like good news in this moment when I was bereft of good news in my own personal life. And so that's the moment when reading Paul become, became very important to me, and, and is still important, uh, and I, I'm, I do a better job of understanding Paul. But there, there's this moment when Paul is going through such a challenge that, that seems very fitting to bring up for us today, as, as we're, this, we're looking at, at All Saints. If we look at Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, I, I want to sort of go over the first chapter. We won't read the whole thing. I would commend that to you, but uh, we won't go over, we won't read the whole thing, but we'll read how it starts. He writes Paul, that Paul and Timothy, both of us committed servants of Christ Jesus, write this letter to you, to all of the followers of Jesus in Philippi. We greet you with grace and peace that comes from God, our Father, and our Master, Jesus Christ. Every time y'all cross my mind, I break out an exclamation of thanks to God. Each exclamation is a trigger to prayer. I find myself praying for you with a glad heart. I am so pleased that have you have continued on in this with us, believing and proclaiming God's message from the day you heard it right up to today. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day that Christ Jesus appears. And after giving this like exclamatory, joyous beginning to this letter, I'm so thankful for you. He says, you know, and I know I can be thankful for you because you have been with me even when I was in jail. You have supported me. And that I hope you continue to learn to love well. And that even while I'm in jail here, there are others who are proclaiming the good news. And that is a beautiful and wonderful and joyous thing. And then later at the end of chapter one, I'm going to keep this celebration going because I know it's how it's going to turn out. 
Through your faithful prayers and the generous response of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, everything Jesus wants to do in and through me will be done. I can hardly wait to continue on my course. I don't expect to be embarrassed in the least. On the contrary, everything happening to me in this jail only serves to make Christ more accurately known, regardless of whether I live or die. They didn't shut me up. They gave me a pulpit. Alive, I am Christ's messenger. Dead, I'm his bounty. Life versus even more life, I can't lose. As long as I'm alive in this body, there's good work for me to do. If I had to choose right now, I hardly know which I'd choose. Hard choice. The desire to break camp here and be with Christ is powerful, i.e. die, all right? Some days I can think of nothing better. But most days, because of what you are going through, I am sure that it's better for me to stick it out here. So I plan to be around for a while, companion to, do, to you, as your growth and joy in this life of trusting God continues. You can start looking forward to a great reunion when I come to visit you again. We'll be praising God and enjoying each other. You, you catch what, what he's getting at there? Like, Paul is in jail. And while he's in jail, on most days, Paul writes, it is clear that it's better for him to keep living than to die. Now, if you walked into my office tomorrow and said, Andy, most days I think I'd like to live. There are more days that I wake up in the, wake up in the morning and I want to live than days I wake up and want to die. We would we would have some discussions, right? You would have my complete attention. If someone says that there are some days they wake up and think, you know what? It's just time to go be with Jesus, right? You, you have my attention, right? That, that's not something I hear people say often. Like, it makes me wonder, how bad has it gotten for Paul? that this is something that has even crossed his mind. Like, think about how bad it would have to be for him to think, you know what, maybe it is time for me to cash in my chips. Maybe it is time for me to break camp, so to speak, and, and, and I'm done with this. To, to live his, his service to Christ, to die, is to go be with him. I think it's time to just go be with him, right? Now, I have not had that experience that Paul is talking about. I don't know how common it is to think that this life is not worth continuing. It's time to go be with Jesus. Right? After he says this, he then goes on to say how much he looks forward to praising and worshiping with the church at Philippi. Right? And then he gives some practical advice, and at the end of the letter, he gives that famous line that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, which is true, but let's remember the context that Paul is writing from, right? Paul is thinking about enduring even the worst of times, uh, that he can do even those things which, through Christ who strengthens him. And that phrase is misused today, I, I get the sense, right? What is so challenging is making sense of the surrounding comments, right? Because he is talking about the joy of being reunited with them, the joy, the hope that he sees in them, how he is constantly giving, uh, constantly praising uh, what God is doing in the life of the church at Philippi. Like, he is excited for them. It, it, he doesn't sound like someone who is depressed, he doesn't sound like someone who's going through the worst time of his life. It's just sort of like an aside. You know what? If I don't think I'm going to... To die before I get to see you again would be gain, but I'll probably get to see you again. And most days I wake up and I think that's what I should do. If we flip the page from Philippians, you go to the next letter in the New Testament, you find Colossians. And, and the beginning of that letter has this phrase that helps me understand how Paul can live this way. He writes, our prayers for you, the church at, at Colossae, our prayers for you are always spilling over into thanksgiving. We can't quit thanking God our Father and Jesus our Messiah for you. We keep getting reports on your steady faith in Christ, our, our Jesus, and the love you continuously extend to all Christians. The lines of purpose in your lives never grow slack, tightly tied as they are to your future in heaven, kept 
taught by hope. That line, that is powerful, right? This is how Paul's doing it, right? That the lines of purpose in your lives never grow slack, tautly tied as they are to your future in heaven, kept taught by hope. This image that Paul uses, that we are pulled towards a future with lines of purpose, pulling us day by day, that these lines are taught with hope. The hope that we have, the hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus, the hope that we have, that we are headed towards the kingdom of Christ which is to come, that we follow him with a purpose. Every day, we're living lives of purpose, for we're, we're living lives that follow Jesus. And those lines of purpose, kept taught by hope, are what pull us forward. This is what I've been reading in my mornings as of late. I'm outlining the letters of Paul, and I know that unless I take the time to outline them, uh, I, I'm not going to learn them. I need to really make sense of Paul, how Paul thinks, right? And, and as I was reading this image, as I was going Philippians to uh, Colossians, I came to this page and I just stopped. I closed the book, I sat there, and I just pondered what this meant. What does it mean to live a life full of purpose, with lines of purpose pulling us forward, kept Taught with hope. That this is what pulled Paul through, even when he had hit the point where he, had, he was asking this horrifyingly hard question, right? Is it better for me to live or to die? Well, it is better for me to live, for I am being pulled towards the kingdom of God, being pulled by these lines that pull me towards what Jesus desires. Having that sense of purpose rooted in a hope that pulls us forward, I got to confess how much I need that. All right? I need that hope because it doesn't come naturally for me. Some people seem to be naturally hopeful, and I am so thankful for them, and I bask in them. I need to be around hopeful people because hope doesn't come naturally for me. There's a book. Uh, from 1929, the title itself is worth the whole book. I bought the book just on the title. The rest of the book is great, but the title itself, it is, a, it is Leaves from the Notebook of a Tamed Cynic. It's written by a pastor in the, in the 1929s when he wrote it. So in the, from experience, he had leading a, a small rural church in the 1920s. And, and just the way that he is a tamed cynic. And to be a follower of Jesus is to have one's cynicism tamed. And what is tamed cynicism? What tames cynicism is hope being pulled towards a future with lines of purpose, kept taut with hope, is what tames our cynicism. I can be a buzzkill. I, I am so, so sorry for that aspect of my personality, if it has impacted you, but that's just tr the truth of it. I can be a buzzkill so easily. And to read the stories of this pastor whose cynicism was tamed by hope, to read Paul, knowing how much he went through to the point that he had even considered the question of whether it was better to die or to live and to see how he responded is utterly essential for me. All right? he was, Paul was wrapped up in the hope that his life was lived in the direction of the kingdom of God. And he writes about this. He continues in the first chapter of Colossians. He says, We pray that y'all, the church at Colossae, that y'all will have the strength to stick it out over the long haul. Not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glory strength God gives. The strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy. The, not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the strength that spills over into joy. This Sunday is All Saints the day which we remember all the saints who have come before us, all that they have endured. But they endured it not with the grim strength of gritting their teeth. They endured in a way that spills over into joy. 
At a time like this, I look back across the history of the saints, the saints being anyone who has lived a life following Jesus, and who having followed Jesus in life now rests from their labor. Right, this is the day that we pay attention to the saints across all history, all the way back to Paul and his ability to find joy and rejoice even when imprisoned. This is the day when, when my mind is drawn to look back across the, to the history of the world, to, to ponder the saints who endured persecution by the Roman Empire, the saints who survived the Black Plague between, when between a third and a half of all Europe died, the saints who made it through the French Revolution without losing their heads, the saints who survived the trenches of World War I and II. Right? Thinking of the saints that are closer to home, I think of the farmers who survived the death the the Dust Bowl, the droughts, the Great Depression. I think of the people who grappled with the interest rates of the 80s when they should have been retiring and handing over the farm to those who followed. We stand in a long succession of saints, all meeting the same description, having lived lives of purpose. Their lines of purpose on their lives, never having grown slack, tightly tied as they are to their future, kept taught by hope. And because of that hope, what they have passed down to us, right? the legacy they have passed down to us is that it has overflowed into joy. They did not survive by the grim gritting of teeth, as Paul describes, but with a joy, a strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy. My friends, what the saints have passed down to us today are the things that give us joy. The hymns that we sing, the meals to be shared, the recipes that we treasure, right? the gatherings that we have, these are all what the saints have passed down to us, and we take joy in them today. There are candles to be lit, births to be celebrated, lives to be shared. All saints is the day that we remember that they have gone before us, and their joy spills over into our lives, and that we join with them with lives of purpose, pulled taught by that purpose towards the kingdom of God, and those lines are kept taught by hope. And so this day, this, this Sabbath day, receive that. Receive that good news. Your lives are lives of purpose. Line, with lines that hold you and pull you towards the kingdom of God as we follow Jesus. And that this day and always, those lines are kept taut by the hope we have in the resurrection that once happened and the life that is to come. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, for your saints we give thanks. For all that they have done to show us how to follow you and how to follow not with clenched teeth, but with joy and song, with feasting and friendship, we give you thanks. During these days, continue to hold us taut with cords of hope, pulling us towards your future when we will be reunited with those who we so dearly miss. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you this day and always. Go forth now in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.